Shukran. I want to begin by saying thank you to the entire NUCOT team, to Sarah, to Joaquim, to Hussa, and to everyone who's helped me be here today. So this uh, talk comes from a larger body of work, a larger body of research on how we're writing the history of photography in the Middle East. There's an enormous expansion in the scholarship on this subject right now. Most of it, in fact, in English, as Rana discussed previously. However, the vast majority, 90% of that scholarship at least, focuses on the Ottoman Empire, the 19th century, or contemporary artists. What I'm talking about today is how can we write a history, how can we incorporate an art history and an analysis for all of those photographs that fall in the 20th century and out of the traditional purview of art history. The talk is called Hidden Likeness, Art Photography and the Alchemy of Writing a Modern History of Photography in the Middle East. A few years ago, I was contemplating what to do with the opening remarks of a paper, and I had logged on to the New York Times website, clicked to the international section, and encountered the photograph on the screen before you. I was struck, profoundly so, by this picture, which seems to have become something of its own genre of photographic subject. Here we see a woman's hands, identifiable by their shape, and also by the pair of double gold rings she wears marking her marriage. They are creased and worn by labor, but plump enough to seem apparently middle-aged. And they stretch outwards towards us, palms upward, in a universal gesture of supplication, of offering, of pleading. They are resting lightly in these palms are two diminutive photographs, also familiar in their style. In fact, the photographs in her hands are so universal in type that they are barely recognized as a photographic genre at all. Every adult citizen of a nation, driver, international traveler, and so on has myriad pieces of identification with photographic portraits very similar to these. What, then, is so captivating about these banal ID photographs to make them the focal point in the New York Times? Moreover, what about this subject has drawn the interest of award-winning photographers Susan Micellis and Fazal Sheikh? Sheikh's book, The Victor Weeps, features a series of photographs taken in Afghanistan of this precise nature. And it was when Mycellus began to notice ID photographs, worn as pendants on necklaces, pinned into brooches, and otherwise displayed in daily life, that she was inspired to begin the ongoing, extensive research collection that led to a suspension of her own documentary practice and the establishment of the archive, aka Kurdistan. AKA Kurdistan contains thousands of pictures representing the photographic heritage of the Kurds, the only such archive of this nature. The repetition of ID photographs suggested that these photos, that this type of photograph, had significant symbolism and layers beyond its utilitarian value. And if so, so might other seemingly banal pictures. Likely, these small portraits were also originally taken to serve a simple purpose of visual identification for these young men, and they continue to speak as official documents in a language of authority that testifies to their physical presence, and in the hands of this woman, absence of the individual portrayed. Yet, when photographed again, framed as an ornament of another figure, they have a second meaning. They are transformed into reliquaries of the disappeared. They are subjects transformed into martyrs and saints. There is a hidden likeness between two types of photography we see here. The ubiquitous, universally familiar ID photo and the narrative photograph that in documenting the performative use of these photographs captures the transformation of that ID document into a story a story that begs for context, historical circumstance, and additional knowledge. These pictures reveal the gap between photography as an international mechanism of governance, administration, and a popular practice, and the art history of photography. Today I'd like to ask the question, how can we write a history of photography which includes practices that look familiar, but tell a different 
culturally specific story? And I will begin to answer this question by suggesting the generative capacity of pictures such as these that reveal gaps between the document and the narrative and between the understood and the abstract. Michel de Certeau, in his influential book, The Writing of History, examines the relationship between the act of writing history and establishing hierarchies of political and cultural power. He explains the dialectical nature of history as, the word history vacillates between two extremes, a narrative that is recounted, a story, and actual events, geschichte. Between the two meanings, there is a space in which work and mutation are possible, because the historian always begins with the former and aims at the latter in order to prize open a crack between the lines of culture that will reveal something that happened elsewhere in another way. My research is a quest for these hidden likenesses and that in-between space between documents and narratives where, as De Certeau promises, work and mutation are possible. In this space, alternative meanings and multiple modernisms emerge from pictures otherwise dismissed as ordinary. We see the expanded significance of ID photos only here, here only when they are taken from their original context and in the vernacular of today's conference, copied and pasted into a photograph of a recognized contemporary photo artist. A similar practice of representation has occupied the Lebanese artist Akram Zatri for years. A grid of men some in canvas coats of soldiers, others in street clothes, each wrapped with the symbolic scarf of Palestinian and Arab nationalism, engage the camera with a direct, determined gaze. Another grid of pictures, some women and some men, but never mixed, enter the studio for a series of alluring romantic poses. Engaged in amorous kisses or leaning one against the other or play acting a wedding scene, these pictures communicate in a visual language of postures developed for couples through painting and cinema, as well as in photography, as well as in photography studios. Unaltered from their original negatives, these pictures have been transformed through their presentation by contemporary Lebanese artist Akram Zatri. Here they are printed as large format, high quality art photographs, and carefully sequenced in, presented, and sold as a grid from which the studio documents become a cultural narrative of studio genres. For more than a decade, Zatri has been working in a close symbiosis, symbiosis with mid-century Lebanese studio photographer Hashem El Madani, who owns the longest running studio in Zatri's hometown of Saida, Lebanon. Madani took many types of portraits, formal, fictional, humorous, but the most common request especially as it became increasingly common for families to own their own snapshot camera at home, was for ID photos. Zatri minds the archive of Madani's studio, selecting portraits that seem to reveal part of the popular consciousness of the era, or at the very least, the tropes and strategies of Madani's photographic gaze. Then the negatives are reprinted placed in a series that followed the visual language of contemporary conceptual art and circulated, this time within the international art market. In the process, Zatari shifts the economy of the original images and as such, their function, value, audience, and historical meaning. For each print sold, Zatari shares profits with Madani. Zatari's methodology is shaped by his position as president and co-founder of the Arab Image Foundation. Established in 1997, the Arab Image Foundation is the largest archive of photographs of the Middle East taken by its residents. And Zatari's work with Madani represents both a conceptual engagement with archival strategies and that of a traditional conservator and preservationist. Additionally, Zatri has become the archivist in a traditional sense of Madani's oeuvre of original photographs, as well as glass plate negatives, gelatin roll film, studio books, and materials. All of, all of this material from Madani's studio has been gradually transferred into the archive of the Arab Image Foundation, where it is housed in archival processes at the highest level of industry standards. 
Thus, Zachary's project reveals an, a multiplicity of subjects. It is simultaneously an elaborate portrait of Madani, a cultural portrait of mid-century Lebanese photography, and a historical portrait of the medium as it once existed, hand tinting, retouching negatives, cameras and all. The contemporary art grids provide the means for the original photographs to be preserved, seen, and to have their historical relevance considered. The whole system, however, relies on the documentary role, the role as testament to history of the original studio proofs, much like those ID photos. Official ID photographs are standard studio portraits. All of the photographs we've seen so far would generally be dismissed from the dominant history of photography written through photographic societies and collections of museums and institutions in Europe and the United States. As such, I offer these previous examples not to feature exceptions, rather to offer a set of case studies that succinctly illustrate a pair of practices that have become two of the dominant frameworks in writing a history of photography in the Middle East. First, conceptual renewal of the photograph by contemporary artists. And second, inscription into a historical narrative through entry into an archive. In the first practice, the original historical photograph is reinterpreted in a different genre, one already integrated into the institutions and economy of art photography. In the second, it is relocated to a new context, an archive. In each instance, the recasting of the photograph allows for a consideration of practices that look familiar, that bear a likeness, but tell a different culturally specific story of photography. Of course, neither of these gestures is isolated to the Middle Eastern subjects. However, bo however, both are particularly well suited to its photographic heritage. Archives, rather than art museum collections, are the primary repositories for photographs from the history of this medium in the Middle East. And there are both historical and contemporary rationales for this situation. First, however, let's go back to the beginning and set the stage. Photography entered the Middle East with an archival imperative. It is not uncommon for texts on the history of photography in the Middle East to begin four entire decades before texts on photography in Europe, beginning here with the 1798 expedition of Napoleon to Egypt. Taking with him in his military retinue hundreds of painters and draftsmen to catalog every aspect of the natural and built environments they would encounter, these pictures were published as engravings, as photographic engravings, or as photorealistic engravings, in the multi-volume description of Egypt, and established an accurate record, record of the lands of the Ottoman Empire as, the central, as a central aspiration of the 19th century. Thus, the summer that the French government reached an agreement with Daguerre to purchase and patent his formulation of the daguerreotype process as, quote, a gift of France to the world, end quote. The French statesman, statesman Francois Arago marked the occasion, not only with that pronouncement, but with a series of speeches imploring his audience to resurrect the documentary mission of Napoleon's original campaign to Egypt just 40 years prior. It did not take long for his premonition to materialize. From 1841 to 44, Joseph de Prangy created over 800 daguerreotypes, just like the one you see here, of architecture across the expanse of the Ottoman Empire, and he was only the first in a list of many. Likewise, with a keen, aha, likewise, with a keen interest in the mechanisms of European modernization, the Ottoman sultans quickly saw the value in photography as a means of archiving the empire. On October 28, 1839, just months after public circulation of Daguerre's processes, the newspaper Takim i Vekai, which published in Arabic, Turkish, and French, reported the invention of photography, including a detailed description of its technical processes. In the Ottoman court, the medium found patronage as a tool of governance, propaganda, and documentation of the empire. In 1863, Sultan Abdulaziz I, who you see here, appointed the Abdullah Freyr Studio as court photographers 
making photography an official branch of the state and court art. However, photography would enjoy the greatest patronage under Sultan Abdul Hamid II, who employed photographers within his court as well as learning the technique himself. In the tenuous era of his rule at the end of the 19th century, which coincided with political and economic strains on Ottoman lands and the fracturing and loss of provinces, Abdul Hamid II used photography to survey his military corps, follow the visits of foreign dignitaries, and generally watch over the empire and its citizens. Thus, photography's origin in the Middle East were dominated by officially sanctioned practices intent on forming archives, whether from foreign or local perspectives. In all cases, similarly, these archives were programmatic. The photographs were taken to create facts of a premeditated narrative and institutionalized as the official documents of national histories, eliminating that productive tension Desertot points to between the story and its documents. It is against this dominant narrative of the origins of photography and this dominant model of the photographic archive that I want to position the case studies with which we began today. Susan, Micellus, and Zatri have both chosen to work simultaneously creating artworks and establishing formal archives of photographs representing the full history of the medium for an ethnically or culturally, de culturally defined population. Unlike the commissioned archives of the first decades of the medium, these archives are retrospective. They look backwards into history. Building on the authority established in the 19th century imperial archives, these current archives create an alternative and yet official history outside of the dominant and ruling historical narrative. Such archives can, in fact, serve the purpose played by the contemporary artist in the introductory examples. These archives, much like Mycelis' photographic frame, point to genres of photographic practice overlooked by traditional art histories, but vital to understanding practices of the region. Project SAVE is an archive of photographs founded in 1975 in the suburbs of Boston, where the largest community of Armenians outside of Turkey lived in the 20th century in the early 20th century. Mining the pictures of the Project Save Armenian Photograph Archive, a group of montages begin to stand out. In the left-hand picture, we see the mother and father of the Movsesian family. Mr. Movsesian lost his wife in the Armenian Genocide of 1915 before he moved to Worcester, Massachusetts. Here in the left-hand photograph, his daughter kindly stands in for her mother by resting her arm on her father's shoulder to replicate a pose of marital pride, a classic trope within studio portraiture. An older photograph of her mother is cut at the shoulder and carefully pasted in so as to assume her proper role in the photographic history of this family. Poetically, that family group is completed in the portrait to the right where the mother's physical absence and emotional presence are merged in the picture's composition and her role shifts as she resides in the hearts and minds of her family. I'm going to move us forward. Alone, these montages are quirky examples of the popular practice of montage within family albums that was commonplace practice in late 19th and early 20th centuries. However, together, and combined with other montages in the archive, they form a powerful narrative of a photographic genre specific to the Armenian diaspora community in New England. Following the persecutions of the Anatolian Armenians, sorry, Following the persecutions of the Anatolian Armenians leading up to World War I, significant diaspora communities formed in Cairo, Aleppo, and Beirut, and the largest groups settled in Boston. Of these, only the Boston area was entirely outside the territories of the former Ottoman state. Thus, the development of a montage practice that speaks to the separation of families and an archive that demands the acknowledgement of the creation of the Armenian diaspora resonates in this context. If we don't recognize the pictorial language of New England diaspora 
studio portrait montages as unique from that of montages in amateur albums or avant-garde data satires, then we may well fail to recognize the distinct pictorial tradition manifest in the performative portraits from Madani's studio. Madani, as others, leased studios on the first floor above the street level such that visitors' privacy would be protected. Within the strictures separating the expectations for clothing and behavior in public versus private space, the portrait studio represented a liminal, in-between, semi-public, semi-private world. By avoiding a street entrance, once visitors entered the stairs, they could be visiting any of the offices or residences in the building. This context gave the studio, portrait, studio portraiture a unique character in the Middle East. These pictures might look familiar. We might think we know how to interpret them. However, once lined up against other examples of such practices in the archive or differing practices across archives, they reveal hidden likenesses. A history of photography specific to the region rises to the surface. The Museum of Modern Art in New York recently acquired two 16 photograph grids by Zatry. MoMA framed the acquisition as that of a leading international artist whose photographic practice represents the archival aesthetics and post-conceptual practice that are hallmarks of today's avant-garde. This is accurate, and they were right to do so. Contemporary photographers like Zatry from the Middle East are now being enthusiastically written into survey texts and the dominant narrative of photography. And this is great. However, it is so because these contemporary artists operate within the recognized aesthetic language of an international avant-garde. The greater challenge to photo historians, museums, and modernists alike is to restructure our histories such that the vital and thriving studio practice of modernity fits into our understanding of the mid-century modern photography as clearly as Zatry's rearticulation of it does today. To write a more globally inclusive, comprehensive, and accurate history of photography, it is essential to pry open that crack where another narrative of ID photos, family snapshots, and studio portraiture can be pulled out. It is essential to refuse histories that coalesce around one overarching narrative. The history told through these archives speaks in multiple voices, sometimes harmonious, sometimes dissonant. Thank you. Thank you, Mitra, for a wonderful lecture. Now, does anybody have any questions? Just out of curiosity, uh, recently I was at the openings of the reopening of the Sursop Museum in <clears throat> Beirut, and I saw many of the um, photos and archives you just show. I was just uh, wondering if it were it was actually from the archives of Sursop or is it related? The current director of the Sursok Museum in Beirut was the founding director, executive director of the Arab Image Foundation. And she was with the Arab Image Foundation until about a, a, two, a year and a half ago when she transferred to the Sursok Museum. So the, the connection is very tight, very yeah, direct. Yeah. Uh, because I saw some of the archives uh, they had underground and they, they were really amazing. And I saw some of the works you just showed uh, over there. So it was uh, really... Uh, really great to see Her name again. is Zaina Rita, and yeah, yeah. she's Zaina done an incredible, uh, incredible work for preserving the photographic heritage of the region. In part, speaking to what Rana was addressing in the previous talk, in addition to creating a collective along with the founding, the three founding photographers of the Arab Image Foundation, they've built a partnership with MEPI, which is the Middle East photographic preservation initiative, which brings together the leading photographic conservators in the world who happen to be based, truly, it's not my national bias, at the Getty Museum and the Metropolitan Museum. And they've created an initiative where they're working with groups of photographic collections from across the Middle East in, on an annual basis to teach the, the best standards of photographic preservation. 
Photographic conservation is a very young field, which is why you can identify the leaders. It's, there are very few of them, in fact, still today. Uh, yeah. Uh, at one point, you made a reference to the uh, Napoleonic book of Description de l'Egypte. Yes. And uh, struck me one statement you said that it is the beginning of photography. Can I, uh, could you elaborate on this point? How would you differentiate between this particular very important piece of work and any other photorealistic work that actually came before it? Why would you actually stop at that point in particular? <clears throat> Not in reference to the Middle East, in general. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> you caught my, my uh, when I was trying to read and be slightly animated, you caught my, miss, my, my slip. <laughs> Which is to say, the description of Egypt happens, in fact, 40 years prior, or 30 years prior, it's published in editions over decades, prior to the invention of what we call, what, what we date as the invention of photography. And yet, interestingly, when you read histories of photography that focus on Europe, they begin in the 19, most, for the most part, they begin in the 1830s, whereas many histories of photography in the, focused on the Middle East begin with the publication of the description of Egypt and with the Napoleonic uh, voyage of 1798, which tells you that if you're predating a history of photography in the Middle East to photography as a medium or as a canonical medium or a European medium, then you're, you're inscribing a specific narrative a narrative of colonial, of making a colonial catalog onto that very history. Well, one other question that's related also, there is always a, a problematic aspect connected to the description de l'Egypte, which is the phenomenon of Orientalism. Orientalism that is actually the West looking into the East, not necessarily depicting the accurate realities of Egypt or the East in general. And in your reference, you said this is really Egypt from real Egypt, which is quite problematic because it is not real Egypt. It's Egypt from the eyes of the French. It's a colonial it's a vision colonial of vision. Exactly. I don't think it's an Orientalist vision, but that's a, the whole discourse of Orientalism. I think it's a colonial vision of Egypt. Okay, that's to be discussed, but it's, okay. it's almost synonymous sometimes, anyway. It's often synonymous. About this studio, and regarding the same-sex um, photography, uh -huh. was that insider, and um, from um, was that the product of the Medani studio as well? And could you just elaborate briefly um, about those as well? So, uh, Hashem El Madani is a is a photographer based in Sidon in Saida, Lebanon, just south of Beirut. And uh, he, he represents a very quintessential example of studio mid-century studio photography, which is the dominant practice in those decades in the region. And the reason, one of the things that's significant about the Arab Image Foundation and what makes it an archive rather than a museum collection Many, many things, but is that they attempt to collect our, uh, collections as a whole. So Akram Zatari, and they collect collections, or they collect estates, as opposed to a museum collection collects typically one print at a time, or one group of prints at a time. And the reason that I believe Akram Zatari chose this studio and chose to develop this relationship and bring that in to the archive is not only because it represents a very important practice, a quintessential, a characteristic practice of that era, but also because that's his birth town. So they ha he has a, a personal investment and a personal relationship, which is another thing that Rana mentioned is that collections often form around subjectivities, around the personal identity of those people who are building the collection. And the Arab Image Foundation is most certainly one of those. Even though it attempts to put together the largest collection of photographs by practitioners in the region, 
It also does so based on the research interests and the collaborations of the board members, of the artistic board members. Uh, what else can I tell you about Hashem el -Madani? The same, the portraits you saw here are in fact from his studio. I, what I, part of what I'm trying to suggest here is that these are often interpreted today in a contemporary context as being homosocial or being about same-sex relationships, when in fact they are, I, I think this is a false interpretation. In this context, on the second floor of a studio building, they're really performances. The studio was a space where you could, this is not about these two girls being in a relationship, this is about these two girls, there being nothing taboo about them having physical contact with one another. They're just friends, and they're able to enact their, uh, you know, whatever personalities, whatever in roles they want because of the semi-private and the space allowed by the photographic studio. And so if we read them as we would a European photograph from the same time period, we will have a false reading. And this has been, happened many times in scholarship, is that we display these in contemporary art shows, and then we compare them to contemporary artworks internationally, and we miss the whole context of the Arab, or the Lebanese, most specifically, 1950s or 60s photographic studio. What more can I tell you about Madani? He's, he's Muslim, he's middle class, he's still alive, he's great. Yes. Great. Can we limit him just to the studio? I remember seeing a fascinating picture that he took of bodybuilders outdoors that's in the Perez Art Museum in Miami. And it really struck me, wow. It, it, it really it made, you know, it, it ended up over there and it's, uh, it's attracted quite a bit of attention. Yeah. So he, as more and more people in the mid-century, as more and more people have cameras in their home, his practice changes. Fewer people are coming into the studio to have portraits taken, like, oh, my time's up, in red. <laughs> uh, like any of these that we've seen, and so they've cut me off. But, uh, but fewer people are coming into the studio, so what happens is his practice shifts to ID photographs, as I showed, and then to street photography, where in order to find business, he must leave the studio and go out. But professionally, he's trained and he operates out of his studio. So even when he goes out into the street, he comes back to his studio. And so I think within how we under discuss photography, even those street pictures, he's taking them as a professional photographer, not to take a document of the street to display in an art context, but as a studio picture. Great. Out of the studio. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mitra. Shokran. <clears throat>